Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to the history and future of Google Web Toolkit. My name is Ray Cromwell. I'm tech lead for GWT. And we've got a really jam-packed um, set of presentations today. And so I'd like to just jump right in, because we've got seven years, believe it or not, of history to cover. So often people actually come up to me and say, why, this, why did Google even create GWT in the first place? Um, you know, isn't JavaScript good enough for you anyway? I mean, why do you need Java for web programming? And um, so I think it's instrumental um, to go back and look at the context in which GWT was conceived seven years ago. And so if you think back seven years ago, which is an attorney in web time, Web 2.0 was just starting. Ajax apps and rich internet applications were just being created, the first sort of series of them. And people were actually thinking back then that the future of rich internet applications was going to be something like a war between Adobe Air and Microsoft Silverlight. I mean, there were conventions on this. And people did not think that the browsers were powerful enough to do really, really capable applications. And then Google released Gmail in 2004 and Google Maps in 2005. And I think that started to change people's imagination. Because for the first time, especially with Google Maps, people saw an application that was written in the web that was fast, it was fluid, it was, in fact, this was before touch, it was touchable. I mean, the way you interacted with the Google Maps application is you grabbed it with the mouse pointer and flung the map around. And so that fired up people's imagination and people really wanted to start building rich web applications like this. But at the time, if you looked around and surveyed the landscape, there wasn't a lot of good tools to do this in just raw JavaScript by hand. In fact, jQuery, which is really the most popular library out there, wasn't even released until 2006. And I think um, probably Bruce Johnson and Joel Weber, who created GWT, were sitting around somewhere in a cafe, and they were saying, you know, how can we solve this problem without building our own JavaScript IDE and our own JavaScript testing frameworks and uh, build servers and all this other kind of stuff that's been there for a long time? And if you look at Java, they were like, wow, it has 7 million programmers. It's got IntelliJ and Eclipse, it's got Ant and Maven, and it's got JUnit and TestNG, and it's got bug analysis software and dependency package management and all this stuff. The only thing you can't do with it is you can't write a client-side web application, except if you want to do applet or something. Aha, if only we could compile Java to JavaScript, it would close the loop and we'd get massive leverage on that ecosystem. So that, I think, was the foundation context for GWT. And so it's evolved a lot since then. The first version of GWT was released in 2006, um, followed very shortly by a few other versions that really didn't add much but fixed bugs. And the really important thing is that with GWT 1.3 in 2007, early on, we released it as open source. And for the first time, everyone could contribute to GWT if they wanted to. And it was also the first to get OSX support. Later in 2007, we added JUnit testing framework support, as well as automatic sprite sheeting. This was another first, because back in 2007, we were automatically creating CSS sprite sheets on the fly, well before actually people had built tools to do this for job, hand-coded JavaScript. But the biggest thing people were asking us over and over again is, when are you going to have Java 5 support? We want generics, we want enums, we want autobox, and all that stuff. And so they did a fire drill, they crunched down, and in 2008, they got Java 1.5 support. In fact, 1.5 was one of the biggest releases. It added not just Java 1.5 support, but this new overlay type system that allowed you to link with JavaScript for the first time with zero overhead in the compiler. It had a new low-level DOM API, com Google GWT DOM, and we added CSS themes to the widgets for the first time. So everyone who used GWT early on knew that the widgets had no style whatsoever. Out of the box, they just looked like nothing. And so we added a couple of uh, CSS themes, at least so out of the box, you know, someone could actually look at the app and not puke. Um, <laughs> and we added this thing called linkers, which has some useful uh, things that I can perhaps get into later. And with 2009, we um, basically um, redid the event handler system to make event handling um, more generic and not just tied to the DOM, but now you could fire custom events and you could reuse events on both the client and in your server code. We added code coverage support with Emma. We added war directory support, so you could just point our tools at a war directory and it would just work. And we added a parallelized build system that today is mostly used by Google. Um, in 2009, we had a minor release that mostly just added support for IE8. 2009, though, was the year of a really big release, and that was GWT 2.0. And GWT 2.0 was an overhaul. It was the biggest release ever. We added a totally new dev mode, so you could develop 
in development mode with any browser you liked. So you, whether it was Chrome, or whether it was IE, whether it was Safari, Firefox, you had the same experience. Previously, we were bundling a really old version of Firefox or IE directly into the GWT toolkit, and so you couldn't even upgrade the browser you were developing with. We added draft compilation to speed up your compiles. We added this new templating system called UI Binder. We added layout panels for um, really efficient uh, CSS style layout. And we added co the code splitter, which is an overhaul of the compiler to allow you to tell the compiler that certain pieces of code don't need to be loaded when your app starts up, but they could be loaded later. And a new system for bundling resources into your application, which was called Client Bundle, which is the evolution of Image Bundle, which did sprite sheets. With Client Bundle, we also bundle in CSS, and we have a CSS compiler that performs optimizations on the CSS to shrink that down as well. In 2010, we partnered with VMware to support their cloud, and that necessitated um, a new RPC system that was not as tied to Java as uh, GWT RPC was, and that was Request Factory, which is a more JSON-oriented RPC framework. We added data binding with the editor framework, JSR 303 bean validation support, model view presenter pattern support, and a new um, system of cell widgets, were, which are uh, efficient um, widgets for rendering like tables and grids. And then we had a couple of minor releases. We added a, um, we acquired this company called Instantiations, and we released as open source and for free a WYSIWYG designer for GWT UIs. We added a lot of HTML5 support, like Canvas and storage and things like that. And we dropped in a little bit of uh, stuff for Google in terms of uh, enhancing app integration, app engine integration. And then finally, in the last release, um, we sort of started to think that we need to move off Ant and get more towards Maven, so we just sort of Mavenized it. So um, that's where we were. That's the history of GWT. So where are we today? Well, as far as we can tell, the SDK has been downloaded over a million times, um, but that's probably not an accurate number because a lot of people are getting it from Maven Central now. We have over 100,000 monthly active developers um, because our software basically periodically checks to see if there's a new version to give you a notification that you know, GWT 2.5 is available. Uh, and so we at least know of Eclipse users, there's 100,000 active developers. We have deep integration with Eclipse through the Google Eclipse plugin with IntelliJ and with VMware Spring Tools. And our products are used um, widely within Google, uh, including our biggest product, which is AdWords. Google Flights, Wallet, Offers, Google Groups, Blogger, many that you haven't even imagined that were written in GWT. And we did a couple of fun things. We ported Quake, first person shooter in 2009, using GWT to the web, and it ran smoothly, 60 frames per second in the browser. And Angry Birds for the web, if you've ever played for Chrome, is written in GWT. So GWT today is a mature, high quality code base. What more could we do? Is there anything left to actually do to improve GWT? And I'm happy to say, over the last year, we've done a lot. In fact, the GWT 2.5 release that we're introducing today is the largest release we've done, I think, since GWT 2.1. We've added more stuff in 2.5 than we did in 2.2, 2.3, 2.4 put together. Let me go over a few of them. First, we did a lot of work on the compiler. So out of the box, with no changes to your code, uh, if you just recompile your application, you're gonna get a substantial code size reduction. For example, the showcase application, if you just recompile it with GWT 2.5, 14% smaller JavaScript. And that probably is undercounting because the, the GWT user library has added a lot more bloat in terms of the, the underlying uh, library code. So it probably would have been even smaller. The mobile web app, 8% smaller. Your mileage may vary. The larger the app, probably the better the benefit. Smaller apps, smaller benefit. But we can do better. We also integrated the JavaScript closure compiler that's used at Google for like Gmail and G Plus and, and Google Docs and a lot of other or large JavaScript applications. And that, the closure compiler has a lot of really low level JavaScript optimizations that we never really would think to do in GWT because it's, it's Java oriented. Things like you know, um, putting bang zero instead of true. Or if you have a number like 10,000, rewrite it as one E you know, four in scientific notation. Saves off two bytes. But, um, here you can see, if you enable Closure Compiler, you get an extra 5% code size reduction. So now, versus GWT 2.4, recompile and just switch on Closure Compiler, we're 20% smaller than GWT 2.4. But we can do better. We've also looked at the code splitter. And so the Showcase application, for example, does a lot of code splitting. So if you're not aware of what code splitting does, 
it allows you to pick parts of your application, let's say like a uh, compose window or a settings page, that might not be displayed immediately when your application is lo loaded up. And you can mark them as split points that the compiler has the option of deferring and loading later. So we can move that code out into a separate JS file, shrinking the initial size of the JS that has to be loaded. And so any bit of code that's exclusive to one particular fragment and is not shared is called exclusive code. And what I'm showing up here is there's two split points. They have some code that's only referenced within those split points, and then there's some, like let's say job util array list, that both of them use. And so anytime they're shared code, we put that code in a shared fragment called the leftovers fragment. Now here's the problem. As you continue to increase the number of split points in your application, the probability of there being shared code between any two um, split points rises. And what that means is that that leftovers fragment at the bottom gets larger and larger. And so when your application loads up, before it can run any of these split points, it has to load the leftovers fragment because it's a shared library. So we need to do something about that leftovers fragment. And what we do is we perform a kind of clustering we analyze all the fragments that, that you've split out and look for ones that are most similar, that, are, that basically use the most amount of code together. And we merge them into one fragment. And hopefully, there's a lot of shared code that no longer is used by anybody else. It's only used now within that new smerged fragment that you see there in the middle of the screen. And that leaves the leftovers fragment down the bottom empty, where we've hoisted some code out of it into this new shared fragment. So, what kind of effect could this have on an application like Showcase? 39% reduction in code size of the initial JavaScript that your application has to load before it can present the UI to the user. Um, the first time I saw this, I thought we had a bug in the compiler, and it was wrong. It was removing too much code. But it's, I've measured it several times, and it's true. 39% code size reduction. But there are other things we had to do. We had to improve the overall diagnostics of the compiler, things that you might rely on, like if someone's running your application and a user hits an exception, how are you going to find out what happened and what line of code it happened on? So there's this new standard that Google's proposed and other people have adopted called source maps. And what it does is whenever you compile anything to JavaScript, be it Java, Clojure, uh, CoffeeScript, whatever, we write out this standardized mapping file which says this piece of Java or CoffeeScript or whatever source language became this bit of obfuscated JavaScript in the output. By having that bidirectional mapping, now when you go to debug or inspect obfuscated compiled JavaScript code, it can actually tell you the original line of code that it came from in your source language before you um, messed with it. So this permits deobfuscation of JavaScript, but it also allows GWT, more importantly, to construct perfectly accurate stack traces. So right now, today, if, you, if the user encounters like an exception in one of your good applications, you get the line number of the, uh, of the method, the name of the method that it occurred in, but you actually don't actually get the actual line number of code within the method that it occurred on. And in fact, if the compiler has inlined several methods and rolled them up into one, you actually don't even know what method it occurred in because now those small inline methods are not even on the call stack. They've been basically moved into the parent caller. Not so with source maps. Now you'll actually know the exact original function, regardless of optimizations, where the error occurred. It's Chrome only for now. Firefox has demoed it, um, and they promised to support it. OK, so this kind of dovetails into um, super dev mode because it's what enables it. But here's the problem. So over years, people have complaining we haven't kept our dev mode C++ plugins up to date. Um, basically, we use these native plugins that we install into the browser so that when you run in dev mode and it's running Java code and it has to, it has to remote control the browser until the browser like add a DOM element somewhere, it talks to this plugin, which then remote controls the browser to actually update the browser. The problem is, is that the browser vendors have accelerated their um, iteration on their browser. It used to be they would release a browser once a year, Firefox 4 or 5 or whatever would take a year. And that would give the GWT team more than enough time to actually update three or four different plugins on three or four different operating systems. But now we simply can't handle it because every six weeks they're releasing a new version. Uh, like for example, every time Firefox releases a new version of Firefox, it breaks the C++ um, um, plugins that we have. So we needed a new solution. Plus on things like mobile devices like iOS, you can't even have plugins in the browser. So how would you debug a good application on an iPad? So what if we could create a GWT compiler that was so fast we can compile your Java code in one second. Biggest complaint we get is the compiler is slow. 
What if we could speed it up so we could compile your code in one second or 10 seconds? Then we could actually, you could actually iterate by loading up JavaScript into the browser. And with a combination of source maps, you actually could debug source level Java code right in your browser. So let me show you a demo of that. So I've got, a, I've got the Gwit code server running, which is the new um, super dev mode server. It's a servlet. It starts up on your Gwit module, and basically it's waiting there for me to connect. It's going to serve up the compiled code. So I'm going to um, go to this application I have called uh, Silver Comet. And hopefully I've got a network connection, and um, it can load up. And uh, let me see. I might be in trouble here. Let me. Uh, if that doesn't work, what I'll do is I have a local. I have another version. Sure, let's do this. I'll just skip ahead for a second, and I'll come back to that and show it to you. All right, let's, let's, let's go to that go for a second. Oh, okay, there it is. May I had a network up. Okay, so this is an application. It's graphing marathon data from the Silver uh, Comet Half Marathon in Atlanta. And you can see I can do things like I can hit a character, click on a person, it shows me where the runner is. And if I were to try to debug this today, I bring up the Chrome Inspector. and I go to um, scripts, you can see that it's basically uh, compiled JavaScript. So it would be really hard to like, set a breakpoint in here, and, in here and debug it. So let's go down to here and click on this little, in the Chrome Inspector, this little gearbox and say um, enable source maps. So now I'm gonna click this, um, I'm gonna go back to the code server and I'm gonna drag this little bookmarklet up here. And I'm gonna turn on um, super dev mode. So, let's so hopefully, um, I'm trying to reload. <laughs> I think my network's having problems. Okay, there it is. Okay, so I'm going to click super dev mode, click compile, and um, it's compiling. And usually this takes like uh, less than two seconds, but network is loading already, so it's already finished, but it's loading the loading on the bottom. There we go. That's reloading the compiled JavaScript. It's already been compiled at this point. Um, if I go over to this window, over here I can probably show you. Compiled in 0 0.979 seconds, if you can see that. So the, the issue is that there's some kind of network um, thing that's not hurting my demo here. Let me bring up the inspector and see if I can show this to you. Oh, okay, there it is. So it's back up. I'm gonna go to the scripts tag, tab now, scripts. And now you can see I have Java code in here. And I, I promise you it won't take this long when you actually do it on your own computer. So I'm gonna go and I can, I can set a breakpoint here. See that? And I'm gonna actually come up here and hit a character. And you can see it's doing a breakpoint. I can hit play and you see the things up there. So I'm stepping through Java code. In fact, you can do something in super dev mode that you could never do in regular dev mode. I'm gonna step down into a Disney function. So I'm gonna step into this item show, step into remove property. Um, oh, it went into another. And there you go, it's a JSNI JavaScript function. You could never do that before in super dev mode. <laughs> uh, regular dev mode. So let me go back to, let's go back to slides. Okay, <clears throat> UI Binder. If you use UI Binder, um, we got some more good news for you. First of all, if you sell widgets, you can now actually, um, you don't have to write Java code, you can actually specify the template for a cell that renders in a table grid uh, or in a tree with uh, a UI Binder template. Uh, there's sort of a new interface called UI Render that does that. Secondly, um, we've optimized the way UI Binder constructs the HTML and injects it into the page significantly. We've vastly reduced the number of DOM operations down to just a few. And the, the end result of that is that um, startup latency for ORCID, which also uses GWT, was reduced by 20%. And the rendering speed at which it can refresh the HTML on the page went up by 300%. 
So not just the compiler has been improved, but the speed of the widgets has been improved about the 300%. And we've also started the beginnings of adding support for um, using the same IE18N message classes that you use on the client side in the server. You, so using gwit.create in the server. And what that will get you is sometimes um, you want to share code between the client and server in terms of um, internationalization um, resource bundles. And this will basically get you there eventually. And we've updated the ARIA library support in GWT to the newest W3C standard. So if you have ex accessibility concerns, we've got more better support for that. Lastly, we're introducing a new, and I caution you here, experimental library called Elemental. And so what is Elemental? Well, over the years, as I said, the browser vendors are iterating faster and faster. It seems like every week they're adding a new HTML5 API to JavaScript. And we just can't keep up hand wrapping those APIs. So every release, GWT 2.2.2.3.2.4, we add a few. We added Canvas, and then we added local storage and index database and so on. But there's just too many. We can't keep it up as a manual process. And so what Elemental is, it's a library that builds a complete 100% HTML5 mapping to the latest Chrome, WebKit, and soon Firefox by actually looking at the C++ source code definitions for the, what the JavaScript runtimes use for exporting their APIs and auto-generating a set, complete set of GWT classes that directly call into those APIs. But it's all done, and I got a type going there, with JavaScript overlay types. So when you compile this, they all melt away, and it's as small or smaller than you could write by hand and call these APIs. There's no overhead. Every API you could think of is there. Web GL, Web Audio, Sockets, RTC, even Web Intense, Shadow DOM, these new things that you might have just seen at the show today. We have a new set of collection classes that um, you can use in, in, as an alternative to Java Util collections that are mapped directly to underlying JavaScript collections. Um, so there's no overhead if you use like maps or arrays, no extra bloat. And a new JSON library, similarly, that has no overhead if you use it, just directly access JSON objects um, and no bloat in the output. I think this is an excellent library for uh, um, doing mobile device development because the mobile device browsers are often on the bleeding edge of CSS3 and things like that because that's how they get their extra performance. And so, um, it could also work for desktop, um, but you might have an exist, you might have be already using the existing stuff, and so you'll have to decide whether or not you want to move over to this library. But um, try it out, and I'm going to show you a demo, real quick. And I cooked up sort of a hack to um, to show you the power of Super Dev Mode and to show you the power of Elemental. And so what I've done is is I've built this servlet filter that if you try to load up an HTML page. And if you have something in there like this, so I'm going to type a script tag. And I'm going to say type is equal to text slash, no, not JavaScript, Java. And in here, I'm just going to write, like I would write JavaScript, window.alert. Hello. Believe it or not, that's Java code, not JavaScript. And so I've got this servlet filter that when this file is being piped out, We'll catch that script tag and see, oh, that's Java code. Automatically synthesize a GWT module entry point on the fly, run it through the super dev mode compiler, compile it in one second, then replace it back with a regular script type equals text JavaScript, and then the page loads. And so um, my computer is kind of slow uh, on, a on a real computer. If Google would upgrade my computer, it would run a lot faster. But I'll show you that right now. Um, let's see, 8090 slash index. So I just wrote some code there. And um, let's, uh, whoops, I, okay, is it running? It is running, okay, having demo problems again. Oh, that's because it's on my local machine. That would make all the difference, okay. So let's let that load and there you go. So now you can develop, if I were to release this server filter for you, you can actually develop Java code in a really lightweight fashion where you can have multiple HTML pages and just sprinkle a little bit of Java code in each page, a page at a time, and just get a little tiny bit of jo compiled JavaScript out of it. Well, why would you do that? Well, simple. Any of you know by heart the new WebRTC camera API? I sure don't. It's a, there's a lot of APIs in HTML5. But because this is Java and this is my Java IDE, 
um, you know, I can do things like this, you know, window, this is the elemental library, dot get navigator, dot get, uh, and you see all these APIs in geolocation, platform, plugins, product. Uh, I can do WebKit get user media, which is the new WebRTC API for getting access to the camera. And so you get full completion, all of the normal stuff you love in your IDE, but with the sort of lightweight HTML programming experience. So let's try that out and see if that works. It's gonna take a second to recompile, and hopefully this works. There you go. So try this out, it's experimental, but it has a lot of cool APIs in it um, to try out. Okay, so you've seen the past, you've seen the now, let's talk about the future. So one of the problems that's been happening over the last year or so is that our ability to iterate on GWT by taking outside community contributions has slowed a lot. And the reason why has been paradoxically due to GWT's success within Google. So as more and more internal Google apps migrated to GWT, um, we could not take much of a chance accepting patches without thoroughly re uh, reviewing them. Imagine somebody submits a patch and it puts a, a bug into you know, AdWords. You know, we could lose billions of dollars of revenue. So we had to be really careful about accepting external community patches. So um, you might have noticed a lot of frustration with the issue tracker because you know, we had an internal issue tracker and we were prioritizing internal bugs. We had hundreds of internal GWT apps and you know, our internal customers come first compared to the community, because that's where our money's coming from. And so um, I thought that was a really sorry situation to be in, because a lot of the people in the community have, have contributed so much to GBT over the years, and we, we really needed to do them better. And so I suggested, and we've adopted, that we're going to basically change the governors, governing body of GWT to no longer just be Google as a dictator, to be, but be as a peer. So we're introducing the GWT Steering Committee. So now the control over the future roadmap of GWT and what features go into it and who gets to be a committer and who's a code reviewer and what patches get landed is now going to be controlled by a committee of um, several of the top you know, star contributors to the GWT community and some of the biggest companies using GWT. And Google goes from being now a gatekeeper to a peer amongst equals. So we have to be more responsive and more, we have to think more about what other people are using it for, not just what we're using it for. Um, the steering committee is going to determine what the project guidelines are, what the policies and philosophy of the project is going forward, and determine who gets direct commit access uh, to the master branch. And it's going to set the overall future roadmap, as I said. And we've drawn it from a mix of star contributors, and here they are. This is the initial GWT steering committee. It's Google, Vaden, Sencha, Red Hat, um, Thomas Breuer and Stefan Haberman, who have done an enormous number of bug fixes to GWT over the years. Daniel Kirka, who's done an absolutely awesome mobile GWT library, and Christian Goudreau, who, who's done the, uh, of ArcBeast, who's done the GWT library, which a lot of people use because it extends our MVP library, and it's really fabulous. And we've already had some early decisions. We've had a couple meetings already. We've decided, and this might please many of you, we're moving the GWT repository from Subversion to Git. <laughs> And we're going to have two official branches now. The master devline trunk, where all of you, who if you fix a bug or you have a feature, can submit your patch and it can land, whether or not it may break an internal GWT application. This will be the bleeding edge branch that everyone can get a nightly build on and try it out and we can figure out what needs to be rolled back. But if it makes it through the dev branch and it doesn't destroy anybody's applications, then it might, it's going to be cherry-picked into the beta branch, which represents the work on the next release, let's say GWT 2.6 or GWT 3.0. And the beta release is what Google is going to be building our internal apps off of. And so there's going to be a lot of quality assurance done on that branch, so you can be sure if you want to pick up something that's a little more stable that you can be a little trusting in, that will be the beta branch. And as our partners like Sencha and Vaid will probably also be shipping code based off of beta branch forks, not the, 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 uh, the dev line. So um, you'll have a much lower prior, uh, probability of breakage. So here's where you'll find us. There's going to be a new website. It's not up net yet, which is sites.google.com slash GWT steering. You can read about all the new rules, processes for contributing to, the, to GWT. Um, and there's a GWT steering mailing list where you can read our meeting minutes and our discussions on what's happening with the future of GWT and where it's going. So you won't have to wait ages for a blog post from us to tell you what's happening. Now you can read it in real time. 
And so now I'd like to ask Michael Mullaney, CEO of Sentra, to come up and talk about all the great and exciting things that they're going to do with GWIT now and in the future. Let me get Awesome, it's great to be here. Um, my name is Michael Mullaney, I, I run Sentia. I'm also joined by uh, Daryl Meyer, who's here in the, the audience, who's the tech lead for uh, Sentia GXT at, uh, at Sentia. Do you wanna stand up and say hi? Hi, Daryl. <laughs> okay, uh, so before we start, just a quick poll. So how many people have developed with GWT since you're in the GWT session? Right, good. How many people have done an app over 10,000 lines? 50,000 lines? 100,000 lines, half a million lines, over a million lines of code. Okay, that's a good distribution. Well, one of the reasons that, um, that we are excited by GWT is because it does really help you with very large applications and very large teams working together. We are a, a company that has about two million worldwide developers uh, in JavaScript and in Java um, across all sorts of um, applications and all sorts of geographies. Um, of that, we have about 400,000 registered community members on an incredibly active forum, so we're approaching kind of a million posts on our forums over time. Uh, we're also expanding geographically pretty rapidly, so we started in, in, um, on the East Coast, but then moved to California. We've just opened a Vancouver office and an Amsterdam office. Um, I'm not allowed to say we're hiring, so I won't say that. Uh, <laughs> we have... Um, uh, a really amazing array of applications built with Sentia Technologies, uh, with XJS, with Sentia Touch, and with um, GWT. We have everything from um, very large clinical trials management applications to CAs, uh, admin interfaces, to Dell's um, warehouse management system, Best Buy's uh, store system, all built uh, with Sentia Technologies. We're primarily focused on business applications and very large applications. That's why people use a, a very structured framework like XGS uh, or GWT. Um, and our goal is, is to take, um, to really provide a complete productivity capability from design time to develop and run all the way to deployment. So Essential Architect, if you stop by our sand, uh, sandbox um, yesterday, is a drag and drop uh, visual app builder for Essential Touch and for XGS, so you can get mobile and desktop on the same tool. Um, and we're also happy to have, um, to be working on GWT designer integration for um, GXT. Sentia Animator is, is, is focused on content animations. On the build side, we have our JavaScript frameworks for mobile and desktop, and we have um, GXT for Java. Our deployment is the newest thing that we have. It's a cloud services that basically provide backend point services like notifications, authentication, and app messaging um, for uh, mobile and desktop applications. Our goal, and I think this is a, a common thing across um, developer bases today, is to, as, as much as possible, provide a single HTML platform across all these multi, in the multi-device multi, multi world, right? So from phones to tablets to TVs to desktops, people are trying to create application experiences that follow you from device to device, that reuse data, reuse models, reuse, reuse business logic and controller logic as much as possible, and that's really our design point um, for Sentia uh, technologies, whether in JavaScript or in Java. XGS4 is a, our JavaScript framework. I won't spend much time on it, but it basically provides structure um, for JavaScript programmers who want to create large, uh, uh, large applications that are pixel perfect across browser. The companion to that is Sentia Touch, which is, a, again, a JavaScript framework for modern mobile devices. We made a bet that smartphones were the only phones that mattered. Uh, it turned out uh, that that was the case. And we do an awful lot of low-level platform code switching and abstraction uh, to make uh, a code base work across um, every device you can think of. I mentioned Architect and I.O. So on to Sentia GXT, which is a meet for, for this room. Um, GXT um, started about um, five years ago as, um, as, uh, as Daryl's project, and then Daryl uh, joined Sentia and merged with uh, the Sentia team. Uh, it's basically fully featured, themable, high-performance widgets. Um, it's a true GWT implementation, even more so in GXT3 than was the case in um, GXT2. And the big thing that GXT brings to the table is full alignment with GWT conventions in GXT3. But really, the thing that knocks you on the head when you look at GXT is just the sheer um, volume and weight of UI widgets uh, that we bring to the table that you don't have to create yourself. 
Um, there's literally several hundred widgets of all types uh, for all types of applications that work the way that GXT um, or GWT expects. So, GXT, we just completed an enormous release, uh, our GXT release. It was just um, released about um, six, eight weeks ago. And it basically takes what we had built um, uh, ourselves from our own custom conventions for things like uh, event handling, uh, all into GWT um, 2.1 through 2.3 conventions. So for example, um, we now use the um, uh, cells to uh, render our trees and our grids, and it's much, much faster and much, much lighter weight. We've also moved to interface-based design, so for large applications, it's much easier um, to create mocks and to do testing. Uh, we've done, s <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, Custom theming, so we now use the appearance pattern. Um, we've pulled out theming information out of the components and out of widgets, so it's much, much easier to add raw HTML and CSS styling uh, into your components without, without, uh, without standing on your head. Uh, we also have much improved model support, so in, in, X, in, um, in GXT2, uh, you basically had to use our custom data stores, and that was the only way of getting data into um, an application, again, without standing on your head. Now you can basically pull, um, pull in uh, model data from plain Java objects or for uh, any beans that you have, much more flexible. Um, we also added full UI binder support, so um, you can declare your UI uh, widgets in um, with UI binder XML uh, conventions. Another thing, strongly, strongly typed layout engine, one of the, one of the big um, issues with our layouts in uh, GXT2 was that you could basically uh, have a lot of mismatches between a container type and a layout. So now we've gone to strongly typed layouts, so it's much harder to make a mistake, and the compiler will catch it if you try and um, a, a associate a layout with a container that doesn't match it. Uh, and there's a lot of other things um, in, the, um, in the release, but basically the whole theme was have um, a huge widget library and theming that works with um, the new GWT conventions um, and uh, I think we've been pretty successful with that. Uh, it's had a great response and a great reception in the short weeks that we've uh, released it, um, and uh, we're really happy uh, to have uh, released it. So we're actually incredibly excited about this opening up of um, GWT with a steering committee. One of the, the main reasons that we ended it with custom conventions in GXT2 was the fact that we had no idea what was coming down the road from the, the GWT team. So we had our own event system, and I think it was literally a couple of months afterwards there was a new event system from, G, uh, from GWT that if we had known was coming, we probably would have uh, aligned with. Um, so we're really happy to um, continue to promote RIA for Java developers. Uh, we're really excited to um, be a member of the steering committee. Um, we'd love to hear, um, you know, as a member of a steering committee, your ideas for how we can improve GWT going forward. Um, you know, GWT, we feel, is the best way for organizations that are committed to Java to build front-end applications, and particularly larger ones and larger teams, and that's what our customer base tells us uh, you know, why GWT is an awesome solution for them. Um, so uh, what are we doing? We've just finished our GXT release, so it's, it was pretty huge. We're just getting around to, um, to planning the next release. Um, but a couple of things we're doing is making um, the appearance uh, implementation we have better uh, with a more flexible client bundle. Uh, we're doing some updates to UI, UI binder, and I think that's some of our changes have actually made it into the 2.5 code base um, theme building. You know, it's, a, it's actually a, a, a huge um, request across our product line, which is how can we do better visual design uh, without having to hack into SAS or uh, hack into uh, custom CSS. Um, better ID, ID support and tooling, so um, there's some support coming in GWT Designer uh, for GXT3, um, but our goal is to make it easier and easier to create GXT applications using uh, standard Eclipse and standard IDEs. Um, there's much, much more detail in, into what we've put into GXT3. We're really proud of the release. Probably the best place to, to learn more about it is um, on our blog, uh, that's the link, just sent you dot, dot, dash GXT um, from our blog. Um, and, uh, and also Daryl and, and myself will be here hanging around after the session if you wanna talk to us more about GXT. Uh, we're really excited about the directions. We're really honored that um, Google has asked us to participate 
in the steering committee, and uh, we hope to be able to serve the GWIT community um, as best we can in, in this new role. So thanks again. And so now I'd like to uh, ask uh, Jonas Lettinen to come up. Uh, he's a uh, CEO of Vaden, which um, also has a really fabulous um, um, framework for GWT. And he's going to tell you how um, Vaden's going to contribute to GWT and what they're all about. Thanks, Ray. Okay. Uh, Yeah, I'm really, really excited to be here and, and see where GUIT is going at the moment. Uh, let's first kind of give a brief intro to what is Vardin and how we are using GUIT and what that relationship is going in the future. So you could say that Vardin is a rich uh, internet, <laughs> is a Java frame, framework for building rich web applications. And as that, it's quite similar to GUIT, but at the same time, it's totally different from GUIT. In Vardin, you are doing everything on the server side. It's basically based on three different ideas. So first, we want to have amazing components, both as a UI components as well as data sources and data integration components, themes, and so on. So we have a really nice set of widgets in the core product, 100 or so widgets. Uh, you can go to wadin.com slash demo to see those out. There are also widgets for mobile, Android, iPhone, iPad, but what I'm mostly excited about is the community around Vardin. So there are hundreds of plugins for Vardin. Those plugins might be widget libraries or integrations or themes or tools. Second idea is that we are combining server-side RIA together with Google Web Toolkit. So what is this server-side RIA? To look into that, uh, take a look at this. So basically you have five layers in your application. So you have the backend layer, you have web server, you have communications, and with GUID, you have a Java to JavaScript compiler. And in the end, you are running JavaScript in web browser. So if you look at GUID, it looks like this. So basically, you are writing four layers, and optionally, you can do some JavaScript on top of that. But it's quite different. In Varden, you are only writing two layers. You're only writing code on the server side. So everything on the RPC layer and on the browser side is totally automatic. You don't have to write any line of code for those. And if you're comparing this to JavaScript frameworks, I truly like XJS. It's probably the best one out there at the moment. So also in here, you are writing four layers. And this is kind of the core of the, of the one. And you can kind of skip half of, the, half of your program when you're writing in Vardin. It actually works like this. So all of the components have two parts. You have server-side component. It's basically API that you're programming against. So whole UI is living on the server side. And on the client side, you have rendering and event handling. And that part is totally done with Google Web Toolkit. And that's the relationship between Google Web Toolkit and Vardin. Third thing, uh, Java. Basically, everything in Vardin is just a plain old Java object. So all of the components are just plain old Java objects running on the server side in a real JVM. And the implications are that you can write any you can write the UI in any language out there. You can use Scala, or Groovy, or Clojure, or Ruby, or what have you. You can use any tooling, any IDEs. You can deploy this to almost any server out there, most of the clouds. And in the end of the day, it's just one jar file. So you can use that in any web project. Just drop that jar, jar file into a project, and you can start adding what in UIs with that. It's Apache licensed, so it's a bit the same license as GUID. So what's the relationship between Vardin and GUID? Let's start from the history. This is actually quite an old project. We started in 2001 already. So we have 11 years of history behind us. And then we kind of started to have a huge number of, of JavaScript code lines on the client side to render all those components. And it turned out to be quite not that nice. So fortunately, GUID came along, and we kind of threw all of that away and rewrote everything in GUID. And the reason was quite obvious. It was kind of perfect fit to Vardin. Both are written in Java, both are Apache licensed, both are component oriented, and both kind of regarded cross-browser support as something super important for us. So I could say that this has been kind of like standing on the shoulder of a giant. This giant being Google and especially the GUID team, they have been doing, you have been doing a really, really excellent job. And it has been 
helping the ride quite a bit. So we had, haven't had to deal with all those browser differences ourselves. So you could see this as kind of engagement period of five years for us. And this is kind of strange engagement, because after five years, we are still totally in love with GUID. <laughs> I, I truly think that the GUID is the best way of building red, rich web application on the client side with Java. So if you are building a huge application, there is, that's the kind of number one way of doing that on the client side. But the relationship has been kind of unidirectional. We have been getting a lot from GUID, and we haven't been get, giving too much back. And I think this is the same for many of us. So we have been using GUID, we haven't been get, giving too much back to GUID. And I th I'm really thrilled to see this no new development with the steering committee and more open process for GUID. So we can start kind of contributing back to GUID. And I hope in the end this kind of grows GUID to be something much, much, much bigger than it is today. So where do we go next? We have been kind of jumping in five-year leaps. What's the next leap for us? So I'm really thrilled to announce the new product strategy for Vardin. We are adding GUID to Vardin. So what does it mean? At the moment, we are kind of using GUID as a dependency. We are using GUID as a rendering engine behind the scenes in Vardin. What we are doing, we are actually moving that inside Vardin. So we are taking a copy of GUID, putting that inside Vardin, and maintaining that ourselves adding features, fixing bugs. And we are, of course, contributing all of those back to GUID. Uh, this also means that Vardin will be compatible with GUID. So for your today's GUID project, you could use Vardin for that. And as a GUID developer, from your perspective, what's more in there? There are a couple of things. But first, there are actually two sides of Vardin after this move. So we have two programming models. We have server-side programming and we have client-side programming. Server-side being optimized for the productivity and the client-side being optimized for the controlling. So you get both around 50% reduction of code lines when you're op uh, programming in the server-side as well as all of the wonderful control over the HTML5 platform on the client-side. So you can see that from a GUID developer's point of view, we are adding server-side area model on top of GUID. We are adding components, tools, themes. But also, there is one more thing. We, as a company, we are living out of support. We are serving companies who are using our technology to build enterprise applications. And now, when we are kind of merging GUID into Varden directly, we are also starting to support GUID directly. So if you are a GUID project, we are going to provide support for you. And this is going to be available pretty soon now. So we are targeting for the Java 1 release with Varnin 7 that will be including GUID. And it's available as a developer preview today. This is an early alpha release, but it's there for you to try out. There is a tons of more things to read about how Varnin and GUID are kind of combine and what are all the aspects of that, go to one.com slash GWT and read more about this. Thank you. Okay, let me switch back to my slides. Okay. So there were a couple of other uh, steering committee members who couldn't be here. I don't want to spend too much time, but um, Crispin Goudreau uh, has developed a wonderful library called GWT P, and he is on the um, steering committee as well. And uh, you know he had some wonderful things to say, and I'll just leave that up there for a second for posterity. Um, as well as uh, Daniel Kirka, who's done an incredible mobile library for GWT called MGWT. I encourage you to go to m-gwit.com and check it out. And uh, he is also on the steering committee, and I'm sure he's going to be focused on making GWT better for mobile. Finally, we are hiring, believe it or not. So if you are an uh, unemployed GWT programmer and you're looking to join Google and work on GWT directly, please send your resume to google.com slash jobs. And now I'll turn the mic over to you, and you're free to ask questions.
Hi. Hi. So my first question is about validation. You said you've implemented the 303 at 2010, but as for now, all, all classes in package validation are marked as experimental, and they say do not use them in production. Yes, uh, okay, I'll answer very quickly. Um, we have recently hired someone to specifically work on the JSR 303 support in DWT and to make it 100% compatible with the JSR 303 uh, TCK test compatibility kit. And so if you look at the commit logs right now, you'll see a new guy who's committing actually one by one, he's fixing the TCK uh, test. And once they pass the TCK, then we'll remove the experimental tag. All right, thanks. Okay. And when the 2.5 will be released? Uh, RC1 is out already. You can go download it now, probably in maybe a, a week or two, the final version, after we get some bug reports back and smoke test it more. Okay, right, thank, thank you. you. I'll go over this one. Hi, um, I'm a GIS developer. I, uh, I use Google Maps um, to do um, uh, in my projects. Uh, most of the, I hate JavaScript, and most of the time I hate, I'm looking for uh, GWT wrappers around, uh, around the Google Maps API. Uh, are you are you guys coordinating um, between the two teams to always have a GWT library for for uh, Google Maps API, once a new version of Google Maps API? Uh, comes yeah, good out? good question. So um, yes, in the past we have done it, and I believe recently they may have released an update to the Google um, API libraries for GWT, which included some support I think for Maps 3.0. Uh, I don't know what state it's in. Um, unfortunately, um, the, um, um, the person who was working on it, Eric Zundel, uh, uh, left uh, to go to another uh, company. Um, but we will try to figure out a solution for that. It may be that the steering committee takes it over. Like, for example, maybe Sancho wants some uh, maps widgets in there. And they can basically take on the task of ensuring that it's always up to date. Um, but we'll find out a solution for it. And we are definitely concerned about it, because maps are actually very important. Thank Thanks. Hello. Mikhail Panasiuk from Aptio. Uh, I'm a grid developer, and our team is mostly, we are mostly using uh, IntelliJ to develop and to debug our applications. And the question is, with the new super dev mood, will we be able to use our favorite IDE to debug applications, or the only way to do it will be right. the browser? Good question. Uh, as you can see, I am a rabid IntelliJ user. I love uh, IntelliJ, and I constantly rag on people at a Google use Eclipse. Um, the, the, the answer is, is that we are um, trying to talk to JetBrains. They've done a lot of good support in the past to basically get support for source maps within uh, IntelliJ. Um, and based on the, the outcome of those talks, if they're willing to do it, if source maps are implemented, or if we write a plugin to do it for IntelliJ, then you could attach, because you know IntelliJ can already attach to JavaScript debuggers. So essentially, instead of attaching to a JVM, you attach it to the Chrome debugger, and all it has to do is use the map to actually map it back into the editor and let you set breakpoints within IntelliJ and use the controls with IntelliJ to control with Chrome. So it definitely is a possibility to make that work, and we just need to talk to the right people and make it happen. All right, thanks. Let's go over there. Hi, um, I have two questions, actually. Uh, first, about the steering committee. Um, I'm very happy to see that uh, Google is uh, uh, accepting more external people, but they have also a little bit concerned because there are a lot of uh, companies that have large libraries who are uh, on the steering committee. Um, how do you guarantee that uh, of these companies have their own agenda? Uh, how do you guarantee that uh, Grid doesn't become uh, bloated right. with their features that? Uh, okay. Uh, so I can answer that. Um, first thing is, is that when we pr initially nominated them, uh, we told them that we realize that they have commercial interests, but we would like steering committee members to also kind of wear the GWT hat. Um, so for example, we're on the GCC committee. The GC, I think you know, Google participates with, GC, uh, with GCC development. And um, of course, people in the GCC steering committee, they're all commercial companies. Some, there are different chip, you know, like AMD or Intel, whatever. So they have interest. But the people in the committee usually uh, do a pretty good job of um, wearing their GCC hats. And we expect that the GWT uh, committee members kind of wear their GWT hats. So if they, are, they have things that are competitive and value adds for their framework, they're probably going to keep them in anyway because they're, that's their value. But if there's new core features they need, like new event handlers or new support for um, low-level operations or there's bug fixes that they have been forking off privately in the past to fix, now they'll contribute them back. 
The second thing is, is that the committee is run by consensus. So if anyone objects, basically, to a proposal, it doesn't happen. So we, we basically all have to agree, and um, some people on the committee will be concerned about bloat, and if you know, someone wants to drop in like a two megabyte JavaScript library, there's probably going to be some objections. Okay. Let me go there. Hi. I have a question about the example you showed with the injecting Java code inside the HTML page. Yes. So you type window from lowercase w. Yes. So it's not, it's not class window. Where does this That's right. window go, comes from? So, um, yeah, so the IntelliJ is actually a really fabulous IDE and has this thing called language injection. So I basically um, taught, told IntelliJ to assume that there's a line in the code that looks like this. Um, window, window is equal to um, browser dot get window. And so, oh. so that is like implied that's there. And then what happens is the servlet filter, when it's extracting that code and writing it to disk, it inserts that line. So the IDE doesn't complain that that mi window variable's missing because it's kind of, it, I told IntelliJ to assume that that's injected. So that's a feature of IntelliJ, so if you're an Eclipse user, you might want to check that out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, let me go to him first. Yeah. Uh, so another question I wanted to ask is about uh, kind of release scheduler for Greet. Uh, what are the next versions, when they will be out, and what features are planned? So probably right. this question must go to new committee. Yes. And what will be the process of, you know, who will decide? Right. Uh, excellent question. And yes, I should have uh, basically made it clear that actually GBT 2.5 will actually be the last official Google controlled release. Every new release, GWT 2.6 or GWT 3.0 will now be basically a steering committee release. And so the roadmap, um, we haven't, we're, we've just started our first two or three steering committee meetings. We've gotten over like things like IP issues and things like that. Um, we're getting to, starting to define the roadmap, where we're going to host it. Is it going to go to GitHub or somewhere else? Um, or stay on Google code, you know? Uh, there's lots of arguments and debates over that kind of stuff. Maven versus Ants versus Gradle. Um, and so one thing we're going to discuss is what's going to go into the next version and when's it going to be released. And so if you watch the GWT steering, GWT that steering at googlegroups.com, you can follow along and you'll probably get some inkling as to when it's going to happen. But probably not as long as the, the, the distance between GWT 2.4 and 2.5, probably sooner. Okay, uh, any last questions? All right, well, thanks for coming, guys, and um, I hope you continue to join TWT.